Hello and welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm a senior editor with the Mises Institute. And back with me again is Tho Bishop, my associate editor. And Tho, we've done this three weeks in a row. Can you believe it? A, a weekly podcast. is Apparently this is something that other people do, but I'm stepping into it now. It's going to be great. And uh, <laughs> we're back this time to talk inflation. And uh, it's obviously it's a it's an issue. And I remember just over the last twenty years, we all pretended like it it was nothing, and that inflation didn't matter. And I remember my boss at my last job would act like there was never inflation, even though he was into affordable housing. And he was like, "Hey," because he knew I was an Austrian. He's like, "Where's that inflation you people are so worried about?" And of course, uh, you know, ho home prices just went up ten percent that year or something, right? That was all asset price inflation. But apparently we only act like inflation matters uh, when it's consumer price inflation is measured in the CPI, which uh, is something else. But that's apparently what's politically potent, I guess, because it's reflected in gas prices and some issues like that. But it is definitely now a political issue and uh, something now we get to talk about with there being no controversy about whether this matters or not as an issue. Uh, the problem now is that we're hearing all sorts of terrible explanations uh, about what inflation is. Uh, but I think we're going to stick more to the political side of things. Obviously, there are endless explanations of what, uh, how to think about inflation properly on Mises.org. Um, and so uh, we'll refer to you a few of those. Uh, but no, nevertheless, let's look a little bit then at how inflation is going to impact politics here and in the and in the coming years, and how it has been an issue uh, historically as well. And uh, so, so where I mean, what what have you seen as evidence of the fact that uh, inflation, I, and not just for people like you and me who follow inflation carefully, but what have you seen to to suggest that regular people are now really concerned about it? Well, first and foremost, we need to reflect that we are now at the full year part for the Biden administration. And if you look at this administration as one in, in chaos and turmoil, um, not only is their record, you know, their, their agenda within the Senate being hampered by moderate Democrats, but there is no bully pulpit there with which Biden can then go around and, and shame, you know, these people to get back in line with the party. A big reason of that is inflation. And you see this with the extraordinarily low approval ratings for Biden right now. It's around between 33 and 40 percent, depending on the poll you're looking for. Um, it's even lower for his vice president. That's the personality aspect of them that uh, Joe Biden with dementia is not the least appealing. You know, it, there, there are worse things than that. Um, and if you look within some of these you know, breakdowns of the polling itself, it's the economy that's number one issue driving things, not COVID, not Afghanistan, not whatever. Um, and it is inflation within that. And it, it's one of those issues that affects people on a day-to-day -day basis. It is the ultimate kitchen table issue. And the reason why, and, and I think there's a lot that people, like us in the Austrian sphere, we need to, yeah, can, can recognize that when we talk about political change and we make these radical sort of statements of, I think, necessary things that need to happen politically, like these are major detachments from the status quo. And I think what makes this period of time so uniquely interesting is that you have this daily reminder that the status quo is failing and costing people on a daily basis. And while it is easy to highlight the consequences of, say, you know, the financial the, the aspects of inf inflation there, financial aspects that came about because of the Fed's policies and, and all of these kind of secondary consequences, very, very bad of the you know, financialization of the economy, once that starts trickling out in prices. I think historically that is when things, when society really kind of connects things together. And, and so I think I'm excited about you know, looking a little bit at, at what history tells us but about this, because the other side of it is that, you know, which direction this energy goes, you know, who has to fix this to inflation? Like if, you, if you're able to sell that fix to the people, that's going to be a very powerful political tool. And I think that's important too, to keep in mind, how can we package good ideas to, to, to handle this environment that we're now in politically? And, of course, the historical inflation episode that everyone talks about is uh, the 1970s, the old stagflation episode that endured from about the late 70s to uh, the early 1980s. And yeah, so that's understandable uh, because that's in living memory still for a lot of people. I think it's still unclear 
uh, how much it will be stagflation uh, versus mm. inflation, because that will just depend on uh, the economic situation in terms of growth. And so if things slow down substantially, as it appears they'll have to if the Fed actually tries to do anything about inflation, because that seems to be the, the tough place that the Fed is in, is it can either try and do something about inflation, which will then cause the economy to slow down significantly, or it can just be too afraid to do anything to affect the markets and then just let inflation rip, in uh, which case that would keep economic growth going, but it would eat up most of your wage growth in terms of inflation. And so how exactly that's going to play out remains unclear. We, of course, know how it played out in the in the late 70s. Uh, and that go, that went all the way back, uh, probably in its most um, severe causes, to taking the U.S. Uh, or closing the gold window, rather, ending the dollar's last uh, link to gold. Also, at the same time, Nixon imposing price controls and all of that spending, huge amounts of deficit spending that incurred during the Vietnam War with all those guns and butter campaigns and everything. And so then that led to a serious inflation during the 1970s. Uh, and I think we'll look maybe at what lessons were learned from that. I think a lot of people, the lesson they learned from that is that Democrats caused that inflation, even though, of course, it was really Nixon for the most part. And uh, so you had real inflation there by the, by the late 1970s. And you can still talk to people who were around back then, and they'll tell, if they have any memory of it, really, they'll remember how difficult it was to keep up uh, their wages, to keep up with uh, inflation. And this was a real issue back then. And so I think a lot of people are worried about that. I think people wrongly just think of uh, gas prices as really a symptom of the inflation. But there were a lot of other things going on with that. It wasn't really just about the gas prices. But there was real inflation. And uh, so uh, Reagan comes in, and they'd already talked about doing this, but they decided, the Fed, at, you know, in a weird moment of history, decided that it was time to actually really tighten the money supply. And, of course, then that led to a, uh, a huge recession, the biggest recession uh, that had been seen since uh, the Great Depression and now uh, is really rivaled by the Great Recession back in uh, 2009, 2008, 2009. And so that was a big deal, and I think that's maybe most people's touchstone then. But of course, inflation occurred at other times as well. It, it occurred uh, in the late 40s and into the 1950s. A lot of people came back from the war, and there was a lot of inflation then. Uh, the government had, of course, spent prodigiously during the war, and the Fed had also intervened and was basically printing money uh, to keep interest rates down during that period as well. Interest rates did not surge after that period, though, uh, perhaps due to uh, the sheer amount of savings that had existed because there wasn't anywhere to spend your money during the war and some other issues like that. But Certainly, the 70s isn't the only time that inflation ever occurred. And it's also important to keep in mind that inflation is not just an artifact of uh, the U.S. being off the gold standard. There's plenty of instances right. of inflation happening before uh, fiat monies were the thing. And because states have always manipulated what exactly the price of gold was in the local currency, and then there were all sorts of issues that happened through uh, the, the bimetallic standard that occurred as well. Uh, but it it is generally a political issue, and uh, people can see that their wealth gets lost, um, and in a time period also where uh, a lot of people, where fewer people um, were necessarily debtors, uh, they didn't. There wasn't <laughs> there wasn't as much of a call uh, for. Uh, inflation then so you could pay back into valued money. And uh, and this is often portrayed as just the debtors being uh, low-income people, which is not accurate, right. really. I mean, most of the debt, the big loans and so on are being taken out by the wealthy, people who already own assets, and they can obtain large loans because they have assets uh, to secure those loans. And so it uh, it occurs. It's not this uh, old system of oh yeah, rich people are creditors and poor people are debtors. So inflation helps poor people. That's just not really the reality at all. There's a difference between small but debtors and large debtors. If you're a large enough debtor, then you get bailed out. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. Like, like, 
Yeah, and so this idea that inflation is just there for the little man, uh, it's clearly there for Wall Street. It's clearly there for the the big borrowers so they can take advantage of that easy money. Well, and and that's one of the things I think is interesting is when we talk about the politics of inflation, there's two different aspects to it, right? One is the reaction to prices increasing in its own right. And I think one of the things that's interesting about this is that you think about all the political movements that change history – that the ones that are the biggest that we talk about the most are the ones where you actually organize like protests, like massive nationwide protests. And you had that with the monetary issue, right? I mean, you had, uh, uh, you know, you, you had people you know, protesting about prices going up in little, little stores in little towns all across the country. Cause like that was a pain they felt. The problem is, is that when you then increase interest rates and they go, go way, way up, like you have your Volcker moment, then what do you do? You get contractors, you know, sending two by fours to the Fed complaining about increasing the interest rates that are necessary to deal with the price inflation, right? And and that's that aspect of this that I think is, is, it's something that is dangerous as well. Like, this inflationary period, I think, is very interesting because the tools that the central bank have had in order to kind of downplay those immediate pains We've had a much larger period of this policy than we than, than politically they've been able to get away with because the new tools the central bank has created for itself to prolong the obvious consequences in terms of consumer prices from all this stuff. And I think one of the things that's going to be scary is that you you have the ability here for politics. For example, uh, recently the uh, Victor Orban of, of Hungary, right, who's a very interesting you know, right-wing Eastern European figure, um, you know, his, his approach to this is we're going to control, we're going to lower prices to where they were last year. Now, some defenders have been saying, like, oh, well, he's going to focus on taxes and, and, and you know, the, subsidize, you know, whatever, like, rather than, like, arbitrarily price fixing. It's like, if, if, if you cut taxes down, okay, fine, that's, that's great, but I have a feeling it's probably not going to be like that, right? Like, you're going to have this push from a lot of the right to engage in, price fixing and trying to address that immediate sort of pain. The other side of it, though, of course, is that you're in a situation where like, we have to recognize that you know, this financial market, like, wait, wait until people realize that Netflix is a systemically important institution because so many people have bought in, you know, their savings depend upon the stock price of Netflix now, a company that has become the size that it has within this ridiculous era, right? And so the, the second you have any sort of reversal, there's normalization of this, you're going to have a popping of these these markets that can, because of the explicit policies of this past decade, you know, there's so many conservative investors otherwise that have exposure to this financial market that, again, I, the, the entire belief that, oh, well, we can rein back in this inflation with the central bank because the Fed's going to get serious about time. It's like, okay, you know, and we've talked about this before. It's like that is not the, the economic environment we're in. Because they're going to be told that if once you start backing this truck up, like you're going to end up, you know, flattening a lot of. Th- so, like the the the, 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 the there's aspects within this inflationary period because of the changes of what the Fed has done in, in this this unique era of monetary policy history that make this unique. And I think again, watching them try to backtrack from this because that's one of the things I think is very clear is that while Joe Biden's approval ratings are tanking from this, and Republicans will benefit from it, you know, what is the solution from your average Republican, or, or even your, your very intellectual conservative to deal with this crisis. Because if you do not have a background and, and, and a rigorous economic view of the world, then you're, you're, you're navigating blindly in this issue where, where again, a, a lot of these people I don't think of, have, because we've been living in this very, this age where monetary policy hasn't mattered. They don't have the skill set necessary to kind of deal with this sort of aspect of it. Yeah, this is a perfect example of how wrong people are when they act like uh, economic theory doesn't matter at all. And uh, obviously, it doesn't cover everything, right? There are issues not that are only tangentially related to economics, like, say, decentralization. Uh, and uh, say uh, interest group politics uh, and uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, population size, all those sorts of things aren't necessarily related to uh, economic theory closely. But this is a perfect example where if you think you can just be a know nothing about economics and uh, and understand the solution to a problem, 
you're just going to be very wrong because, yeah, and you can see that now. And and that standard Republican comeback is this is what happens when you get Democrat policies. Well, uh, no, uh, the Biden administration's policies aren't any different from the Trump administration's policies in terms of runaway deficit spending and money printing. And all of that was exactly the same. There was no difference. And so if, if that's their understanding then of inflation, uh, they're not going to be able to offer any sort of solution. But of course, the solution often, as, as you pointed out, is among sort of these uh, d- hardcore traditionalist type conservatives who think that economic reality doesn't matter at all, that you can just do whatever you want, and that government can solve all of our problems so long as it's a government controlled by uh, people with traditional morality that, oh yeah, we'll just implement uh, uh, price controls. Then that'll solve the problem because I, I can't fathom any reason why that wouldn't work. And it's only those market fundamentalists who think that right. the government shouldn't come in and do that. Uh, but of course, price controls are terrible. And uh, Nixon used them and they were a big reason why the 1970s uh, had so many problems economically. And uh, if, if you have no interest in understanding why that's the case, well, I mean, that's, uh, that's unfortunate. But, but, but don't try and lecture the rest of us about how uh, you know, economics doesn't matter, uh, because it does very much. And yeah, understanding where inflation comes from is a key, key issue. It comes from government intervention. It comes from credit creation. And the way you deal with that is to undo those problems. You don't just pass some law saying, oh, the price of bread can be X, Y, Z. That's incoherent, and it's only going to make things worse. And you actually don't have to engage in a lot of technical explanations about why that might be the case. Uh, It's not actually that hard. Um, But some people are just completely uninterested in the reality of it because, uh, well, because, I mean, history has shown that there's plenty of conservatives who think that governments can solve all of your problems uh, with just the right policy. The only problem with Democrats is that they're using the wrong sorts of policies. But fundamentally, the government will solve the problem. And and that's a problem. I I, I think there's an interesting dynamic there because, like, I I think this is where Austrian economics— and, and particularly the work of, I think it's someone like Aguido Holzman or, or Sean Rittenau or, or, or some of other, even your own work, Tom Woods. Like, I, I, th- I think there's a very interesting dynamic where, where we can play a role here in highlighting that their criticisms, because like, their criticisms of free markets, I think, are an extension of their criticism of liberalism, right? And, and, and they view capitalism not as the way we do in sort of like what happens when you leave people alone and let, you know, you know, institutions and orders kind of rise up spontaneously they rather see it as so, as sort of this this positive agenda being put up you know be, being being put upon the people and and it's this this sort of aggressive uh, attempt to homogenize the world into one big market and and destroy you trying to replace economic ties for national ties and all, all this sort of stuff and, and 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 there's definitely i think aspects in some of the you uh, uh, criticisms of some of of some types of Montpellerin People, right? You know, there, there's some free market economists that I think this, this critique may have a little bit more validity than other the, the, the neoliberal sort of, of of thing out there. I think one of the things that that makes our perspective so important, though, is precisely the fact that I mean, when when you look at like Rothbard's grounding of respect of good economics within the Catholic tradition, you know, and, and obviously Thomas did a lot of work with this and, and others, right? You know, we we are. I, th- I think we can make that spiritual argument in defense of free markets, and particularly sound money, right? Because the, the cultural consequences of sound money, you know, is, is something that I, th- I think lends itself to this idea that, uh, uh, you know, the the best institutions are, are beyond what man can design, right? You know, that there's something kind of, kind of that natural sort of element to it that I, I think is important in some of these circles, um, and. Again, I, I think it lends, and, and what I think is interesting is I think this is also important because, you know, if you, if you look at like Rothbard, for example, his narrative for the success of William Jennings Bryant in the Silver Populist, right, is that his his analysis really emphasizes the fact that Jennings Bryant was able to kind of springboard his monetary ideas within this sort of larger Pietist movement going on within the Democratic Party. And so there, there was almost, there was this cultural dynamic 
that played with this massive, what was kind of this ideological change in, a, in the masses moving away from that, 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 that sound money thing that, that was really a core of both political parties, right? Like w- while there were, you know, issues with the banking policies of, of Lincoln during the Civil War and whatnot, like there, there had been sort of a bipartisan consensus on the sound money issue. It was this larger kind of cultural takeover within the Democratic Party that gave William Jennings Bryant the platform to and engage with his, his stuff in a, in a big scale. Uh, I know Rothbard always likes to point out how, like, you know, this alleged you know, populist movement did not really succeed on, you know, with that with that issue. Um, and I think that there's a similar thing here where def- uh, if there's going to be an ideological change in the money supply, or the, the money question, the way we, we view money fundamentally, not simply as something the Fed can adjust as a policy tool, but rather a complete you know, depolitization of it. I think it's going to need something that is that sort of larger cultural war aspect to it. And, and I, I, that, that's why I think like again, Austrians engaging with these people with a different sort of argument than you're going to get from a, a Friedman night or, you know, the, the you know, defense of free markets because I'm purely sort of materialistic grounds, though those defenses are very, very important. It's more like the harmonious sort of aspect, the way this promotes a more virtuous society, a, a less uh, a society grounded on, on actual measure, you know, fair measurements of, of credit and, and you know, time preference and things like that. I think that, that's something that, that, we, that Austrians have a unique opportunity within this really weird political stage to perhaps get some of those people, save them from what will be the impulse of trying to impose the hard hand of the state, you know, into these, these, uh, uh, uh consequences of inflation. Yeah, there's always, of course, a political aspect to economic policy because uh, once the regime gets involved, economic policy fundamentally is really about stealing from some people uh, right. to help some other people. I mean, there's there's winners and losers with every policy. So I think it's always important to identify who are the winners and losers in this policy. And with this policy, there are indeed certain winners, and they tend to be people who already own huge amounts of assets. And the people who are losers are people further down the socioeconomic scale. And uh, that's, it's hard to point out, but there's but that's definitely a culture war sort of position. Uh, Wall Street and the Fed and uh, the people at the core of the regime who are rich and getting richer. I mean, just look at Congress, look at the Senate, right? This is a body of millionaires and uh, stock traders who, who are much richer than you, much more powerful than you, who have access to special information, and they're being helped out by all this credit creation, and you don't have access to that sort of thing. Uh, I think this is really important to point out. Yeah, we're, we're, we're not arguing, oh, inflation is bad because uh, reason and logic uh, shows us this, uh, this highly technical reason why. Well, of course, the technical reasons are important to have and understand, but the reality is you're probably being ripped off. And that's our old slogan, right? We study economics to understand how we're being ripped off. And uh, yeah, that's an important concept here. And I think maybe that's one of the best things that Austrians point out is Canelon effects, right? Is the fact that inflation is not the situation where more money just appears in the economy. It appears in certain places and it benefits some people faster than others, which means it's benefiting some people at the expense of others. And that's just the reality of inflation. And so uh, maybe uh, understanding better who's who's benefiting. And that's what Hazlitt was always so good about, right? If you read economics in one lesson, he always included just the right amount of interest group politics to show how this economic policy uh, impacted some groups versus others and how that translated then into politics, because certain groups then were going to push for this sort of policy because it helped them uh, and other people... Uh, didn't push for it, or they failed to understand it, and uh, they for, therefore they suffered as a result of those economic policies. So that's very important, and definitely I would say that most of the opponents you see uh, in mainstream debate now about inflation, they're generally getting it wrong, uh, mostly because that would require significant overhaul of the current situations. It would require a whole lot of bad-mouthing of uh, the banking system and the Fed and other people that I think a lot of these elected officials aren't aren't willing to badmouth yet, uh, but perhaps with enough pressure they would be willing to do it. But that takes us to the Fed. Let's I mean let's move on to the Fed and really about the issue of why what is the Fed saying about inflation? They they just seem to they have the most uh, really puerile explanations for it. And they only recently were forced to take it seriously. 
And to this day now, it's just the tiniest little trimming around the edges. Uh, oh, yeah, we're just going to stop adding to our uh, $8 to $9 trillion portfolio, but we're not going to get rid of it. And I, I mean, I just don't see any real serious grown up in the room sort of behavior out of the Fed at all. No, I, I think that they're going to, you know, I, I think any estimates of them having four interest rates increases, like, you know, I, I, then they might get through one and there's going to be, I think, pushback. And I, I think one of the things that's going to be interesting is, you know, that they've just changed, uh, you know, added some some new members to the, the board or have some new nominations out there. I think what you could end up seeing is a, like, you know, a, a weak regime is a dangerous regime, right? And I, I think that given the lack of legislative solutions that the Democratic Party has, I think you're going to end see an, an increase in uh, investigations and sort of criminal actions. And I think there's a very real possibility that the Fed is going to be active, not, you know, it, 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 there's an overestimation on what they're going to be able to do within an interest rates perspective. But I do think you will see an increase in prosecutions and crackdowns of crypto of various uh, 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 industries and things like that. I, I think you could see like a, an increase in like the SEC action against insider traders. And I think that there, there could be a big push to create kind of show trials, trying to create political enemies out of certain aspects of the financial industry, particularly those perhaps least connected directly to the larger financial, you know, global financial system, right? I think they're going to try to make a show out of it because, again, they've backed themselves in such a corner that again i, I think any serious you know, there's, there's not going to be a, a three percent increase like you know there's, there's not gonna be a massive change here um and i, I you know, uh, they're, they're going to try to find some way to get an out I, I think there's gonna be a lot of scapegoats out there yeah i uh i have no idea um if they have any plan where <laughs> they're really seeing the 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 corner that they've been backed into both politically we, we and know economically they don't because the, Every time they have set for themselves a, a a public schedule, they can't keep it up. And, and this has been the problem time and time again. You know, they, they if for ten years now they've been setting projections for growth estimates and constantly underperforming. Uh, uh, you know, they they have these. They created all these new communications tools because the old communication tools weren't working, and then the new communications tool actually wouldn't measure what's going to happen. It just kind of like taking this temperature and it. it you, you, they, they have no idea by their own measure what the, the future is going to look like. And it's just, that's, God, I'm, I'm glad to be, I'm, I'm glad I don't, well, I mean, the problem is, and there, there will be no un accountability for any of this, of course, as well. They, they, these people are going to bail out and into large financial institutions making you know, many, many millions of dollars a year and, and, and ride, you know, the consequences of all this out as, as far as they can. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that the, the, the purpose of this uh, organization is to protect the regime at this point. I mean, yeah, there might have been guys in the past like William McChesney Martin who were like, I, you know, I don't care if I'm popular with this policy. I'm going to take the punch bowl away and, you know, bad things might happen. Uh, but But it's clear that Powell, Bernanke, Janet Yellen, who, I mean, Yellen is so obviously a regime hack now, right? She's a treasury, she's just saying whatever the regime tells her to say. This idea that she was ever some sort of uh, principled economist who is only speaking economic truth is just complete nonsense. Well, think about this, like, say what you will, and there's a lot you can say in Murray Rothbard Wood about J.P. Morgan or Rockefeller, or Vanderbilt, you know, or, or any of these, you know, John Jacob Astor back in the day, right? And, uh, you know, were these people cronies, um, which you can learn about in Liberty Versus Power with me and Dr. Patrick Newman. Uh, but, like, you know, not only these people cronies, but, like, they were individuals who became cronies, not in no small part to, like, their own, like, brilliance, right, relative to the era. You know, get it. Were they taking advantage of the situation? Yes, but the reason they were taking advantage of the situation rather than that guy is because like this guy was usually built a little bit different. There, there's some nepotistic and so, like certain generation, you know, following generations, but like for the most part, within this now, and, and so back in the day, John Morgan, you know, if, if the Fed was doing something completely crazy, John Morgan would say no, right? Like you know, there, 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 there was 
institutions built up whose credibility was as powerful as these institutions. Now, I think about something like Warren Buffett. Hey, is Warren Buffett going to, to speak, be the, be the truth teller to the Fed? I know because Warren Buffett depends upon these same actors, right? This, this entire era of, of, of hedonism has fundamentally corrupted, because if you weren't, like if, if you weren't taking advantage of the situation, then you were losing out on, you know, you, you, you would not be as wealthy as you, 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 you were losing massive wealth relative to everyone else if you weren't riding this wave. And, and so there's a lot of people that, you know, maybe there's, there's some that, that may have, you know, building up their bunker, right? Like, you know, gorging on, on Bitcoin and, and anti-regime sort of investments, fine. Not many people are doing that. And, and so, like, it gets to the point where, like, you know, again, Warren Buffett can't tell the truth. No one of, of any great influence can, can tell the truth in those things because, like, their entire if, – if you, if you start having this, this confidence game fall, Right then, then it, everyone loses. Right, like the, the, it, it, it is such a there. There is so much of the economy that is built off of momentum and and, and the perception that those in charge are still in charge. And once you lose that confidence, it's difficult to put that. Yeah, you know, that, that creates a whole other situation. And that, that's where things get really dangerous. Well, there's not really an independent economy anymore uh, in right. relation to the Fed. Right, uh, they Fed. Uh, where once upon a time it may have been the Fed who took the punch bowl away from the party, the Fed is the punch bowl now. Uh, that's that's where all the economic activity is coming from. Well, not all, but a huge portion, of course, uh, especially related to the case in the past. So, yeah, you you can't just say, well, you know, we're we keep separate from the Fed in terms of what we do, and and so we can offer an alternative voice. There's, there's hardly anything left. In terms of the economy, that isn't directly dependent upon Fed policy and uh, for the Fed to keep the inflation going. So it's really difficult to see outside of those those people who who will very much are on the outside and aren't in positions of power now and don't care if you regard them as non-respectable. Those are the only people who are probably in a position uh, to offer any sort of real dissenting opinion, uh, that you, as you say, right? The idea that Jamie Dimon is going to come out and offer some sort of hard-nosed facts to contradict the Fed or the regime, oh, that's never going to happen. And it's like expecting these Pentagon generals to come out and uh, really oppose uh, U.S. policy in some way. It just doesn't happen. They're all firmly ensconced within the machine. And so, yeah, I don't see... Uh, if uh, the more that business con continues as usual politically, the more it will just continue as usual in terms of economic policy. So you need to I think uh, have a significant ideological and political change there. And, and that's why I think one thing that's important is trying to connect this to the larger sort of decay and, and, and trust in the technocratic state that that is corresponding with COVID. Because you know, what what your average American needs to realize is that again, like outside of, I, I think that the, the period of people that genuinely believe that Dr. Fauci is a good actor is a minority of this country now, and and within that minority, I mean, you know, they'll they'll, they'll have you know candles lit to them, whatever. Like you're not going to save those people, but like I think the majority of the people like have a distrust of the CDC and, and the way that the experts have played this thing out, even if they were wearing a mask until two months ago, right? Yeah, I mean, people with three with with three shots, right? You know, that have done all the things that they have been told to do. I think a lot of them even have doubts about the credibility of these things. And what I think has been interesting is the with that change of the narrative has been that crackdown on alternative voices. And I think what people need to realize is that this is essentially what has been going on within other areas for a very very long time. And I, I, whereas I think with even within the public health sphere, the degree to which the government has subsidized all this sort of stuff, there had still been a very large uh, uh, public presence of, you know, say, say homeopathic medicine types and essential, oil, you know, oil people and alternative, you know, pitching vitamins and minerals and alternative health remedies, right? Like, you know, I think that the degree to which those things were given uh, airtime and things like, you know, every, every year, like you'd have like some sort of big uh, uh, scare about, uh, some virus and it becomes some of the anti-vax issue with Jennifer McCarthy, right? And like, you know, there, it, it was it was something where like there, there was a very, you know, uh, uh, there was a, certainly a, a narrative out there, but the, there wasn't this crackdown on opposition. And I think the more that people see that other areas of this government are bad faith actors within the way they, they dictate the, the scientific narrative, 
I think the more you're going to see that, and hopefully that will that, that connection will be made to monetary policy, right? Because the, the same exact instincts that have played out with the biomedical security state on the public health issue, you know, which which, which increase, you know, which is is militant uh, you know, lockdowns, uh, uh, tracking the you know growth of the surveillance state, right? And not only bad medicine, but you know, genuinely weaponizing this stuff against the liberties of your average day to day, you know, American life. Like that's exactly what's played out in the financial system with, you know, attempts to track. You know, where you have like Mike Lindell, the pillow guy, is being de- him and his charity being debanked because he questions the uh, the election narrative, right, and all that sort of stuff, right? You know, this this entire weaponization. You know, all of that, the, the financial weapons that were produced to go against Iran and, and, and you know, al-Qaeda terrorists and sort of stuff like a decade ago, the same way that we're seeing the Department of Justice crackdowns on like January Sixers and that sort of stuff that we're, we're like, those war on terror tactics are being used where we have our own version of basically, you know, Gitmo with, with you know, uh, 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 Trump detainees there now. Those same tools are now being used financially against people. And again, that, that's what scares me about this moment is I, I think... Th- Using that, those sort of tools that have been part and parcel of this increase of the, of the power of the state, if those really, you know, uh, coercive tools start being regularly used, it's, it's what a weak regime would would do. And politically, that's where we are right now. Mm-hmm. Well, so what what should be done? Uh, I, I know that you had a call on the other day that offered some specific answers uh, to that. And, and so uh, really what are some, obviously what should always be done, right, is ideological change until people actually see a problem with the central bank and its current iteration. You don't even have to get rid of the central bank to massively improve things, right? You could just get rid of all of the powers that the Fed gained for itself just over the last 10 or 15 years, right? Which are massive new powers, all these abilities to buy up all these assets and manipulate the markets and uh, create trillions of dollars and all, of course, enabled by massive amounts of deficit spending. And these these are fairly new things and very, very different from when the Fed was supposed to be just the banker's bank, right? And the lender of last resort. That's one type of central bank. And that's not the type of central bank we have. We have a central bank that that's the agenda setter, that's massively uh, powerful and far beyond what it was just 20 years ago. And, a central bank trying to address climate change. Right. Now. <laughs> right. There's nothing under the sun that uh, the Fed should not touch. And the fact that this is being treated as just normal is really raising the Fed to really just kind of its own branch of government that does whatever it wants, whenever it wants. And that's pretty new stuff. This isn't some this isn't part of the Fed's mandate, uh, which, of course, itself is garbage. But even the current Fed mandate came around in the late 70s. So that's not something that dates from uh, the olden times. Uh, I mean, unless you're like 20 years old, maybe that seems like a long time ago, but uh, it's not. And it's it, and in terms of Fed time, it's it's pretty recent. So they all of these things need to be appreciated. Uh, and so there's so much that can be done, short of even getting rid of the Fed. Uh, right. On the way, and uh, but you've had some suggestions in terms of currency competition and money and those issues. Well, the, the good thing is on that first point, I think we're, we're winning that battle, right? If you were to poll, I think the average American who knew what the Fed was, right? And, and let's let's go ahead and just write off that the number one thing will be what's the Fed, right? Fine, whatever. Put that to the side. I, I think that your average American doesn't view the Fed as some sort of wise institution anymore. Like I think I'm on the left and the right now. Can they articulate the Austrian business cycle theory? Probably not, right? You know, but but I, I think just that 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 very superficial view that the Fed isn't the smart guy, you know, the, the the firefighter putting out the fires, right? Like I think that itself is is a major step forward, and I think a lot of that has to do with the way the Fed has acted in terms of bail like bailouts and some of these these, and, and in part, in large part, due to the success of Ron Paul. And, and the Mises Institute and Lou Rockwell and these people that have that have you know made this a, a, a issue um, within a lot of political circles. Um, but the question is, how do you act on it? And I, I think that's one of those issues is that like a lot of people agree, hey, look, okay, yeah, this dollar situation is is crazy, and I have no idea how they're going to roll this stuff back. But at the same time, I really don't want to poke a giant bubble. Like, no, no one wants to be the guy. That, that deflates the entire thing and, 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 and has everything tumbling down around them. Like, that's very difficult from a political perspective, 
right? You know, what, what president that has to worry about reelection for years wants to make Ron Paul Fed chair if what he's running on is promising you that he's going to bring the entire house, house of cards to the ground, right? Like that is a difficult political move. Um, I think that's, that's exactly where something like currency competition uh, offers a huge opportunity there. And this is something that, that Ron focused on because it's something that can happen at both the federal and the state level too, right? Which is important because you need, you need you know, action, you know, you need some sort of action item that people can kind of organize around. And there's something we can do at the federal level, which is Ron Paul's competing currency bill, um, which is, you know, one of his legislations back in the day, along with audit the Fed. Um, it, it simply, you know, the biggest thing was that it eliminated capital gains uh, uh, taxes and, 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 you know, all, all federal taxes on gold, silver, crypto. You know, I think it was initially gold and silver metals at the time, but could be expanded to include cryptocurrency, which would offer such a huge opportunity for Americans to, you know, go in and out of the dollar and crypto investments without having to worry about IRS reporting, which, which would be it. You know, huge from a, a a surveillance perspective, it would be huge from an industry perspective because like that would attract a whole lot of cra- capital within these industries, and, cl- and also you know, but if it's, it, what it would do is redistribute wealth immediately into the pockets of people that hold gold and silver and Bitcoin and all that sort of stuff because that what that would do to the value of those things as alternatives to the dollar would skyrocket. And so it, it is. It is a political solution that not only is good from a, a, a the, the the principle that it's we need to empower our people to get their money out of this collapsing Fed infused financial system, but it's good politically in that you benefit your friends and you punish your enemies, right? Like that should be the goal. So what, what, what makes Wall Street really really mad, and then let's do it. And then this, this this would do that for it, not everyone, but a lot of people would be very upset about this, right? And then what you could also be done at the state level, though, is is kind of building within trying to create as favorable an environment for these investments as possible. And so Wyoming's done this in terms of the way that they've changed regulation of, of crypto tokens, which has attracted a lot of investment in the industry within Wyoming. Um, it also allows municipal governments and the state government to hold Bitcoin in their balance sheet. And and I think this this that's the biggest thing is that if you can get states and municipal governments empower them to hold Bitcoin and gold on their balance sheets, I think that is one of those, it's it's one of those tangible little boring battles. And sometimes the boring battles are the most important important that you can do. And it's a little way of of in a, in a very small way financial secession from the federal regime in ways that I think if 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 you have a few states doing this, it would be significant. Um, and, and, and you're already saying, you know, it's the same thing that we would, we would suggest for other countries, right? Is to start you know, increasing your gold holdings and things like that. You know, we've seen that kind of play out in certain countries over the last decade or so. If you have that play out at the state level, uh, you know, it, it would be a, a massive shot across the bow of the Fed in a way far more significant than having like a group of a small caucus, of like anti-Fed people, like sign on to ending the Fed, right? Like, yeah, it's. You know, you're probably not going to achieve that, but if you have a, one state that does that, uh, that's that that that's uh, I, I think that would get the attention of a lot of people. Yeah, I think the key issue there is where can I park my money without it being destroyed? And right. too much focus has been on, well, will Bitcoin replace the dollar and then become just your daily money transaction medium? Right, and that's really less important politically than the issue of, can I put my dollars somewhere, get out of the dollar for a time period, and then just have my savings sit there without losing massive amounts of value as the dollar devalues. The, great, the greatest thing the dollar has going for it in terms of its daily use as money is that it's the inferior money. It's you know, People aren't going to want to store it and hoard it and move it away if it's not holding its value, but they will want to spend it on a daily basis, especially if the whole money infrastructure favors the dollar. So this idea that everyone will will dump the dollar and go to the higher quality money or asset that holds its value more, that's not necessarily the case at all. People people will want to keep dollars around so they can use those in their daily transactions uh, and uh, get rid of them as they see fit. Uh, but the real question is, can I can I park my wealth somewhere and not have to pay 20% tax on it when I want to convert it back into dollars. And uh, this is, was actually a real uh, big issue back in the 90s, interestingly, 
uh, because, of course, the peso is devalued, the Mexican peso, as it as it frequently does. And there was discussion back then about uh, monetizing, by which they really just meant right, not taxing it and and letting it be. Uh, something that you could own and not pay taxes on monet- or monetizing or uh, untaxing, if you will, uh, the uh, the peso coin called the Libertad. And that would have enabled Mexicans then to hold on to these coins tax-free. And since silver is just so easy to produce in Mexico and it's, uh, it's something they've long exported, uh, you could then trade in your devaluing pesos for these silver pesos and then just hold them for a while. And you wouldn't have to worry about uh, when your retirement came that you've lost countless uh, amounts of value on your pesos. And so that was the same principle, right? They weren't talking about people keeping in their pocket a bunch of these silver coins that they could go around and buy a loaf of bread with. That was never the vision, the idea, which of course the which Banksico uh, <laughs> opposed uh, in every possible way, was that you'd just be able to park your, your wealth somewhere and then convert it back into pesos later and not have lost uh, a bunch of value. And, and so that's what we're talking about here, right? Because that would then put tremendous, pre- put tremendous pressure on the policymakers to uh, devalue less because then people could just pull their wealth out of dollars and stick it easily in some crypto, in gold, silver, whatever. But the 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 more short-term uh, issue was not that, oh, everyone's going to abandon dollars and adopt this as money. The issue is, how can I save my wealth somehow? And yeah, that's the key issue here. And, and that would work at the state level, right? You don't have to have the economy switch over to something for those state rules to have real effect. The problem, of course, is that the feds can still continue to regulate that and tax all right. of that stuff. Right. And it's also worth, always worth important pointing out when we have a conversation about the Fed that the, the biggest asset that the dollar has is that relative to every other game in town, you know, our people are crazy, but not the craziest. Right. <laughs> and we, and we right. have the largest. So, again, this, this is not a prediction that tomorrow the dollar is going to go down. You know, this is, an, and I think that's one of the things that makes this interesting is that this is, I think, applicable to the rest of the world as well, right? Yeah, the, 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 the same issue within inflation, because again, every other central bank or just, just about every single one has, has followed the Fed lead or, or gone even further. This is something that's, you know, and we've seen it play out with, I mean, even before COVID last year, you had Germans upset about, you know, the low interest rate policy, the ECB, you know, you, you, you have so many European banks that, that are in, you know, have, have done a lot of damage to their balance sheets because of the policies of, of the, the, you know, their monetary policy over there, you know, you, you have a lot of, of where these situations are going to continue to pop up. And I think in general, it's going to be interesting to see within sort of this, this rise of, of nationalist movements against the current standing order, which of those are the ones that prioritize national sovereignty over the monetary issue, you know, as, as, as their solution to the monetary issue, and which ones try to double down on the same policies and, and, and try to give it even more tools to the central bank. I think we're going to see a lot that, I think there's going to be a lot of people that sat on both, you know, you know, there, it's, it's not going to be a uniform answer one way or another. Um, and I think that's going to be very interesting to see play out in real life because, you know, like it, it's the, the current situation, which is, again, people just don't appreciate just how new it is, how, how, how much they've, you know, they've broken their own rules time and time again. You know, this, this is not something that's, that's built carefully, to uh, to incentivize even even you know it, it, the grand plans of the of of the you know World Economic Forum or anything like that it's, it's not like you know these, these are these are mastermind geniuses that have carefully set up a plan to to give these people even more power I, I don't even think it's it's you know five you know, D chess going on here I think it's genuinely the, the hubris and and the, the failure of these people to understand you know what monetary economics really is given the intellectual environment of, of the 20th century. Yeah, and unfortunately, I guess here in America, we're just going to have to create our own alternatives because, as you say, all these central bankers from other countries, they just keep helping the Fed by yeah. having even more out-of-control policies. You know who's done a little bit of good work on this is Brendan Brown writing yeah. stuff for Mises.org, and he's got a great book that I reviewed recently on the 2% inflation standard. And uh, there's a common thread through several of his books, and it just talks about how there once was a time where the Deutschmark um, might have offered real competition 
to the dollar back in the late 80s and in the 90s and certainly after the Plaza Accords where uh, Deutsche Bank um, or the Bundesbank rather uh, had uh, some real hard money people at it. And they were talking about Interesting. Really uh, setting up the uh, the Deutsche Mark as uh, the hard money alternative to the dollar. We were going to hold the line with with the Deutsche Mark, and uh, w- w- if the dollar wants to devalue, that's fine. And then people can flood into the Deutsche Mark. And of course, Germany was a large enough economy where you could do that. But thanks to the euro and all the pressure mm-hmm. brought to bear against the Germans doing that, and uh, that all ensured then that there wasn't any real competition because then the euro immediately became more inflationary than the dollar right. as soon as they could. And so, yeah, if we're going to offer any real alternatives to people, we can't count on any help from foreign countries because theoretically, countries should be wanting to outdo each other in terms of the quality right. of their money. But they're not doing that largely because of ideology. Uh, and largely also because of political realities that they all want to inflate themselves so they can support their own regime so they can get away with massive inflationary binging. There's perhaps some some tragic karma there because, you know, it it was the influence of German universities back at the turn of the, you know, 1900s that so influenced the the sort of progressive era within the United States in a lot of ways. You know, a lot of these, enjoying the German PhD system that, that you know, it created so many issues over here, and and, and then it w- went the other way, with with the Germans letting us down. So, uh, although should, we should probably be more kinda... precise and blame the Prussians. This probably wasn't the Germans there you in go. general. Yeah, there you go. Right? They, <laughs> right? The Prussians are uh, have sowed so many errors on public schooling, on factory work, on all sorts of horrible things. Surely it was just them who had all these terrible money ideas. Also, but I could be wrong. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to take the Prussian pill there and blame them for all the. <laughs> we dive into this more. So yeah, so I guess uh, I guess the the Paris uh, Berlin alliance is not going to do much to offer any real <laughs> uh, alternatives to the dollar. So yeah, I think I agree with you. I think that could be like the the money movements equivalent of the Corn Laws, right? Just as the mm-hmm. Anti Corn Law League was one of the most successful liberal movements in world history in terms of of achieving a real turn toward laissez-faire. Maybe if you really get yourself around the idea uh, and really embrace uh, some sort of money alternative without directly attacking the dollar, that could be, I think, a real central issue that could make a big, big difference with just one small small change. and uh, yeah, so I, I think that could be a real good idea. Hopefully, uh, maybe we can just continue to press for that yeah. and, and see what happens. Yeah, people always prefer the person bringing out the life raft over the person trying to shoot a hole in the boat. Yeah, and uh, right. You're you're uh, just offering an alternative. You're not even really. You don't even have to really badmouth anybody and just say, "Hey, we want more freedom for people." And you know, surely the dollar can hold its own. Uh, we'll just we'll just offer some some other ways for people to save their money. It seems like uh, seems like a good idea to me. Well, we'll have to uh, wrap up with that then, and uh, and uh, let that be it for this episode of Radio Rothbard. Thank you for tuning in a, yet again, and uh, we'll be back in the the near future for another episode. And until then, we'll see you next time. <laughs>